Hi, this is a video about working with CTD data and a particular trimming to what's called the downcast. And this might be self-explanatory. Um, I hope it's at least partly self-explanatory. So I have a file in this directory called, you can see the name of it there. It's a SBE, that's a Seabird Electronics uh, file. So um, I'm on a Mac machine. And so that command that I just typed, I'm in the Unix uh, terminal here. I always work in the Unix terminal. Um, and pbcopy is the thing that Mac has, and it's just going to take the output of the ls command, which is going to be the name of the file. It's going to copy it to the pasteboard, so that's fine. So now what I'm going to do is I'm editing a file called ctd-trim.r. You can see the name of the file up at the top. Um, and I'm in the uh, what's called the vim editor. And um, so let me just paste that in. So I've just pasted in the thing, and I'm going to call it Okay, so in R, I've what I've done is I've assigned to the variable called file that less th less than minus means assigned to. I've assigned it that value. And I'm going to type something. I don't think you can hear what I'm typing, but I just typed a command that makes that line run down below. And down below is the uh, is the R terminal. So if I type file now, you'll see I've assigned that variable. So that's it's fine. That's good. Um, and I just added a line here above. Uh, maybe I'm just going to quickly explain. So I'm in the Vim editor, and I'm using, uh, it's just a text editor, and I'm using what it's called relative line number. So the line, I'm, if you look at the left of the text, uh, that's the color you're seeing is yellow. Might not display perfectly, but that the see the one way over in the left, it says one, and here it says two. Here it says three. So that's indicating the line number I'm on. And then you see a, a one above and below. That's so I can refer to it. I can say one line above and one line below. It, it's pretty common for programmers to use relative line numbers instead of line numbers. Um, that's just in case you're wondering what the stuff is on the left. And um, so the basic thing is that I'm going to edit up here, and, and I'm going to transmit commands down here. And this is how I write our code, basically. and with an editor and just sort of working together with trying stuff out interactively and then saving it in a file. And I happen to be using Vim. Other people use Emacs for this and other people use our studio for this. Okay. Um, so I've run that line and that line. And I'm going to say D just because I'm lazy or, or my name is Dan or something. I don't know, but I, I'm just going to call it, uh, actually, I'm just going to call the file F. <laughs> and I say read.oce of f. And what uh, what read.oce will do is it will examine the file, the file name, and the contents, and try to figure out what the heck kind of file it is. It can recognize, I don't know, one or two or three dozen types of files. So I'll do that. It will recognize what this is. And if I type d now, you see it's a CTD object from a file, and it's got some data. I can also do summary of d. And it gives me a sort of a nicer, I wonder if I, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I'm going to see if I can change the width of this thing. Try that again. Okay, so I just want to make it line up a little better. So it's giving you the instrument serial number and the file name and the start time for the data and the sampling interval. Okay, lat and lon are unknown. This is actually important. I'm going to see why in just a second. And then it looks at all the data, and um, it's for the pressure gauge. In square brackets is the unit and something about the unit. So it's decibar, um, corresponds roughly to a meter, and it's measured from a strain gauge. The minimum value is negative uh, 25 centimeters up in the air, which is a bit suspicious to me. Um, the mean 73, the max 190. There's 5,100, uh, 5,181 data in there. And this thing here says that the original name, name in the file was PRDM. In code, you can refer either to pressure or PRDM. In other words, you can either use what's named in the file or what OCE has renamed it. Um, and, and the reason for that is that the name in the file, there could be, there could be another one. Is there a temperature? There could, there's a TV here, and there could have been two or three or four or five temperature things. And OCE would come temperature and temperature two and temperature three and, and such like. Um, that's about it. And then there's a processing log that says when you read it and things like that. Um, 
you can see it didn't take very long between reading the object uh, that's at 32.266 seconds and uh, creating, creating the object and filling it in. So um, it only took like a third of a second or something. It's not a very big file. 5,000 points is actually not that big. Um, okay, so that's fine. Now I'm going to plot it. Okay, and I see an error message when I plot. And it says that it needs l longitude and latitude, that's location, it, to compute SA. SA is a thing called absolute salinity. And the reason for this is that I'm using the modern equation of state. Um, and so and it requires to know the uh, location of the data in order to calculate things. So what I'll do is, there's various ways of doing this, but So I've gone, I put a line two and I'll run that line two. What that says is don't use the modern equation of state from the year 2010. Use this old one from the year 1981 or, or something like that. And since that's now been done, I can plot it. Okay, so here's a plot. Normally there'd be a map here, and but we don't know the line and let, so I, I, we can't make a map. Um, and this one has got in red temperature in uh, green salinity and um, and I'll just say etc. And down here is a temperature salinity diagram. Oceanographers normally, I normally look at this diagram first. That's the first diagram I look at. And I'm just going to tell you this looks uh, funky. It does not look uh, proper to me. Um, and the other thing is I can see here some traces. So just it's not easy to zoom, so I won't bother trying to. Um, it's uh, there's sort of multiple values in here, and in order to see that in more detail, what I can do is plot profile of D, and then X type is temperature, and you can see here that there's some kind of weird scrambling going on. Um, so then the next, and I'm going fairly fast because it's a video. You can just stop and try stuff. Um, and I really think you should, I'm actually sending this mainly to someone who sent me this file, to be honest. And I don't want to share that file with anyone else who's watching it. So you, other people can't actually try along, but if you had, had an SBI, SBE file, you could try along with that. Um, there's another nice function called plot scan. And what that does is it plots and the argument is uh, the name of a CTD object, which is what D is. Um, okay, so plots versus scan. Scan is like sequence number in the file. Although honestly, some in some cases, the instrument will be left on for like a second sampling. And then if that were the case, then it wouldn't start at zero for the scan. It started at 5,200 or whatever that number is. So anyway, this is just, it, it, it's a sequence number. It doesn't have to start at zero. And here's the pressure in decibars, and 50 decibars is very close to 50 meters. So just think of that as being depth. So it's near the surface, and think of this as being time on the x-axis. It's near the surface, uh, around the surface, and then it got lowered to some you know, depth. I don't know what it is. And then it went back up to the surface, and then it went down. Uh, so what's happening here, and I, honestly, I wasn't involved in the sampling. So um, what's happening here is they've left it near the surface for a while. Um, I don't know why, really, but that's what they've done. And then they've lowered it to some depth here. I can actually find that depth by doing locator. So I did locator one, and I'm just going to click on that. And over here, we can see that the Y value is, so they've lowered it down to about 12 meters, it looks like. And they've left it for a while. This is called an equilibration phase. You're leaving it for, oh, I don't have time here to explain everything about a CTD, but it's called an equilibration phase. Phase. What we almost always want to, co to concentrate on is the downcast. And that downcast starts here and it ends here. So we want to discard uh, everything to the right of the mouse and everything to the left of the mouse. And there's a function that sort of tries to do this sort of thing. I'm gonna comment out the locator. Um, that function is called CTD trim. By the way, if you want to get help on any function, you could just do that. 
And then this thing has popped up. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through this exactly, but I do think you do want to get the help. Trimming CTDs is a, a complicated task. And uh, OCE has made some assumptions based on data files that were available to the authors and they may not work. I happen to know from what we've seen so far, I happen to know it's not going to work in this, uh, in this case, we're going to have to adjust CTD trim. Okay, so let's just try this. So we'll plot scan. So, well, we got rid of the downcast portion. See that it's not, oh, sorry, the upcast portion is not coming up. But I want to get rid of this equilibration phase. Um, and if you do this, uh, um, well, I'll show you again. If you look in the help, there's, um, there's a thing called method. And there are multiple methods, and um, we're going to use the method called SBE. That's what we're going to use. So I'm going to do that. And uh, I'm just going to try it first, but you're going to see that it doesn't quite work. It needs more adjustment. So I'm commenting out that line. Well, maybe I'll keep that one, and we'll just do another one. OK, we're going to have a look at that. And you see that it basically looks the same. It's basically done the same thing. So what it is, is it determines the soaking period and it has a certain um, um, range of pressures. And it looks for, uh, if if you got a lot of data at an anomalous amount of data in a certain pressure range, then we'll call that equilibration. And it has a certain limit, lower limit and upper limit for where it kind of expects to see that. Um, and maybe I'm just gonna go back, back to that help again. Um, min soak, I think is the name of it. Okay. Min soak and max soak. <clears throat> and these values are set to by default. These, I'm just going to play with those things. Um, and you give those, uh, things as a, a argument called parameters. And, um, I'll say five meters for that. Cause this was at like 12 meters or something, right? And max soak. We'll give it for that, I don't know, 15 meters, maybe. And we'll try that. Um, OK, so it worked well. I'm actually not concerned about this, uh, these data in here. Um, if I really were, I would do a little bit more work to, to get rid of them. But the main thing is we've got rid of the equilibration phase. OK, if it hasn't equilibrated yet, it's not giving good data, is it? <laughs> so that's why we want to do that. So I believe that we've got a good one. So I'm going to call it D2 because I'm lazy. I can't think of a good name. So D2 now is, uh, is uh, I don't have to make this so you can see that again. Um, so I've run that D2 thing. Um, so now we'll try plot scan of D2 and you'll see what we just had. So that looks nice. Pop that up to front so you can see it. Um, but now we'll just do a plot of it. Well, I'll keep that in. Um, Oh, let's actually do the profile again. And we're going to do it on D2. Well, I'll run it first on D1. That's D1. And now I'll run it on D2. Can you see it's cleaned it up? We no longer have these retraces and so forth. And I mean, I guess I could do this. Oh, I think I want, I don't know what it's called, yeah. I'm not looking, I'm not looking at the screen as I do this. Okay, so the one on the left is before I tried to, I don't know, can I use the word clean it up, I guess, might be an okay word for that. I wonder if you can still, I'm hoping it's catching the resizing there. So this is basically what I would expect to see. I don't want to see the repeat traces. Um, even the range is different. Uh, this is giving temperatures of like getting close to five degrees. Um, and this is saying that the max temperature, in fact, is about one degree. Um, okay, so that's fine. Um, oh, well, let's do this. Let's do, um, we'll do two by two. Okay, so I'll put a thing here. So basically it's gonna be a two by two sort of grid or whatever. I'm just gonna run all those lines. Um, okay, so the top row 
This is the original temperature profile and the original TS diagram. The bottom row is the cleaned up, I'll say, the trimmed uh, temperature. And Okay, so this looks real to me. How did I know that this looked kind of unreal? Um, well, maybe I'm, what I'm going to do here is I've just added to the two uh, plot TSs, and I'll run them. I've added a thing called type is O, and it's going to connect the lines the lines between the data. And so here you can see proceed, I should have shown the that before, sorry about that. So proceeding down um, through time, uh, the first one is warmest, so that's be at the top of the diagram. It's gone here and these lines, these contour lines here are indicating density. Five means a density of 1,005 kilo per meter cube, 10, 1,010 kilo per meter cube, okay, so it's contours. This sl sl slopey line here is the water freezing point. So I don't draw contours below that. We don't expect to see any data below that. And in fact, we don't, so that's fine. Um, but I mean, sometimes you can, you can have super cold water, but um, the main thing is you can see here as I proceed down in depth, it gets more dense and then less dense and then more dense and then less dense and the more dense. And, okay, this does not happen. You, you almost always in the water column, you see increasing density as you go deeper in the water column. That's just because heavy water falls down below light water. I mean, you could get a moment where just a ship just went by and churned up the top few meters of water. And I guess if you sampled in there, you might um, you might see, these are called data inversions, where you've got heavy water on top of lighter water. But any oceanographer are going to glance at that and tell that that is absolutely wrong. But this one here makes a lot more sense. Um, actually, any oceanographer could look at this and say, that's a high latitude case meaning either Arctic or Antarctic, because we've got some waters which are getting down here. I mean, I could, I could control the scale if I wanted to, I guess. Um, it's getting cl close to freezing down there. These waters here are getting close to freezing. Freezes at about negative 1.8 or something like that. Okay, what was the, uh, can't comment that out. Um, so this line here, which I'll sort of isolate, is really the key. Um, I think if you have some data, just try, just try doing all these steps that I've done. Um, and I'm purposefully not going to give you this code. I'm not going to put the code up on the web. Um, it's better for you to just type it and get your fingers used to typing it. Why? You th This could, well, it has to be a list forever. It has to be a list. But you might have thought, oh, I'll, I'll do it as a concatenated thing, which is a vector, named vector. Uh, that wouldn't have worked. So the typing of it, I think, helps a lot. Um, now you can get fancy if you want, and I'll call, I'll make a thing called uh, fix. So I'm making a function called fix, and I'm just going to, and okay. Now, now that that function is defined, and um, well, let me just run this. Okay, so I have to find that function. So I'm going to say plot fix of D. First, I have to make it into, actually, I think it, I don't have to do that. Um, okay, so plot of D, we get scrambly, terrible TS diagram. By the way, this is wonky as well. Um, these n squareds are, are insane. You're going to see in a minute the kind of n squareds that are proper. That was the first one. And then we plot fix of d cleaner. So I think you want to plot the fix of d. I'll just say one more thing here, which is down at the uh, very deepest pressures, you can see that the, um, that, okay, so the blue here is the, it's the measure of density. So slightly different from the, it's actually it's the exact same as the one you saw before. So this means a density of 1023, but I called it density. It's really a potential density. It's what it is. And we're getting a little bit subtle here and you should have a course of physical oceanography to really know what that is. Anyway, this uh, brown or red line, whatever that color is called, um, is what's called N squared. It's related to a derivative of density and it's gone uh, wild at the very bottom. That's what's happened. And that is basically because of the plot scan thing that we've kept some data that I probably 
if I were doing this seriously in my own work, I would have not only done the this trimming, but I also would have had something to remove. Uh, I might have to write it myself, but something to remove those data when it was sort of hanging out down there at the depth of 200 meters or whatever that was. Those ones are giving slightly funny uh, n squared values, that's all. Um, so I might have cleaned that up. I mean, what does a what does a, a ship cost? Maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars a day to run. In coastal waters, you might do a a cast every hour or something, but in deep water, and like I'll call it real oceanography, you might go for six hours before you do a cast. Six hours, holy cow! Two sixes is twelve. That's a quarter of a day, isn't it? So um, we're getting up to maybe eight thousand dollars is what that cast costs to do. Um, you can't go back in time to redo it. So it's pretty valuable because you can't go back in time also because it costs six or eight thousand um, dollars. So what does the technician get paid? Maybe thirty, fifty dollars an hour. Would it be worth it for the technician if I go back to the plot scan? I'll do that. I'll just do it right here. Oh uh, well, we'll just do that. Um, Okay, I don't think I'm showing, sorry about that. I don't think, maybe if I could do this quickly, I will share again. Um, it's not like I haven't done Zoom before. <laughs> okay, so now I'm sharing both those things again. Um, yeah, so basically what I'm saying, if this thing costs $6,000, and if I'm a technician paid $50 an hour, just making up a number, right? Um, I would probably just remove this as well. And there's multiple ways of doing it. One is to use locator and to click here. And then I would just tell it, okay, seriously, I want you to start at whatever this number would be, you know, 1300 or something. I want you to stop at 2950 or whatever is that. How long would it take me to click to twice and locator and to put those numbers in? You have to call CTD trim slightly differently. I do think you should do question mark CTD trim and study it, to be honest. Um, how long would it take me? Well under a minute, that's for sure. Um, so a minute is, there's 60 minutes an hour if you paid 60, so that's a dollar. Okay, so it's five, I guess I'm using the number six to 8,000 is the number I'm thinking it uh, uh, cost to make the, the cast. Um, is $1 smaller than $6,000? You're damn tootin' it is. The technician could work for days and, and it would still be cheaper. Um, so don't just rely on built-in, I'm coming to my conclusions. Don't just rely on built-in uh, functions and built-in arguments. What we've seen here is that CTD trim, without giving these extra arguments with method and parameters, did not work very well in this file. I can tell you it is calibrated that it worked on most files. Uh, I don't know, maybe internationally collected files, it seems that the Canadian group is doing things a little differently than some other groups that I've, that the code is written for, basically. Um, this is Canadian data. Um, may also be that it's Arctic data and they handle things a little differently up there. That wouldn't surprise me very much. The waters are so different. There's great technical challenges. Um, anyway, don't just, don't just plot something. Consider doing a plot scan to see if you need to trim it. That's one thing. Don't just use the default CTD trim. If it doesn't seem to be working, set parameters like this. If you really care, if you're doing a thesis or writing a paper, you probably only got 50 profiles at a minute each. And honestly, we're talking 20 seconds each to do the locator. At a minute each, you could you could do all the prof all those 50 profiles in an hour. Your coffee wouldn't even be cold by the end of that. Okay, I've meandered around a little bit. Why? I think it's more interesting. I could have given you a two sentences saying, I think you ought to do the following. And then you might've cut and pasted the code and I think you wouldn't have learned as much. And so I'm, uh, I'm here to sort of help you to learn. As I say, I won't be putting this code um, online anywhere. And I would ask that, I think I'll put this on YouTube. Um, so that people can see it. But I don't have comments on in YouTube. So even if I did have comments, I would ask that people don't type the code up and put it in the comments. Because encouraging people to copy-paste code 
uh, I don't know, it doesn't help them to learn anything. Uh, I think it just establishes bad habits. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you did, um, take care. Bye.